What's up guys, today we're going to check out a pair of projectors from BenQ, the TK860i and the W4000i, also known as the HT4550i. First off, thanks to BenQ for supplying these projectors for me to check out. You can find links in the video's description for everything mentioned in this video if you want to pick something up or want to get more info. I've already unboxed these, but this is what comes included with each projector. With the 860i, you get the power cord, remote control, batteries, documentation, and the Android TV smart stick. The W4000i comes with two power cords, remote control, batteries, documentation, Android TV smart stick, and since this is one of the BenQ's higher end projectors, they even include the calibration report. It'll hit 100% DCI-P3, whereas the TK860 cannot. These are fairly compact projectors with the 860i measuring 14.96 inches wide, by 4.9 inches high, by 10.3 inches deep, and it weighs 9.2 pounds. The W4000i measures 16.5 inches wide, by 5.3 inches high, by 12.2 inches deep, and it weighs 15.5 pounds, so it is a little heavier. On the top of both projectors, you'll find a sliding door which hides the manual lens adjustments. You can zoom the lens in and out, as well as adjust the focus. They both have vertical lens shift, but the 4000i supports horizontal shift, whereas the 860 only has vertical. Around back, they share the same ins and outs, with the exception of the 860i having three HDMI 2.0 ins, opposed to only two HDMI ins on the 4000i. Other differences between them is the 4000i supports HDR10+, which the 860 doesn't. The 4000 covers 100% P3 and Rec. 709, while the 860 only covers 98% Rec. 709, so the 4000 will have more accurate colors and better HDR support. The 4000 uses a 4 LED light source while the 860 uses a lamp. They're both rated for 20,000 hours or more depending on your settings. They both are 4K projector which uses TI's upscaling chips. The 4000 uses the 0.65 DLP chip which doubles the chip's native resolution of 2716 by 1528 unlike the 0.47 DLP chip that the 860i uses that quadruples its native resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels to give you 8.3 million pixels on screen. Now that we've got everything set up, let's take a quick look at some of the menu options. The first section here is the picture settings. Under picture mode, we've got a few different presets. We've got bright, bright cinema, cinema filmmaker mode, and then user. Under user management, you can load settings that you've made previously, and you can also rename your user mode. Under fast mode, if you want to lower the latency time for video games, you would go ahead and turn this on. Or if you do not want to game on it, you can keep it off. And then here we've got sliders for brightness, contrast, color, tint, and then sharpness. Under advanced color settings, we've got gamma selection between 2.2 all the way down to 1.8. If you've got the proper calibration tools, you can adjust the color temp here. Again, we've got the advanced color temperature tuning as well. We've got more color management. And then under Cinemaster, we've got a few different options here. We've got color enhancer. Under flesh tone right now, the default is at zero. Pixel enhancer, right now it's at zero, but if we go all the way up and max this out to 20, you can see how much sharper the image gets. So this is essentially just a sharpening tool. For the best image quality, for me personally, I like to keep it at zero. And then motion enhancer, this will give you that motion interpolation for that smooth soap opera effect. Then the local contrast enhancer, we've got off, low, middle, and then high. You can see how the black levels get a little bit darker by changing that setting. Next option here is the light source mode. Right now, this is on the maximum brightness. It's on normal. We've got eco, custom, and then back to normal. And then for noise reduction, we've got a few different options here. We've got off, low, middle, and then high. Next section is gonna be the audio options. Under sound mode, we have a few different presets here as well. We've got cinema, music, game, sports, and then user. Under user mode, you now have options to change the EQ, which you have five bands from 100 hertz up to 10K. Audio output, you can use the inbuilt speakers, which is labeled as Travolo, the optical output, the audio return plus, and then the 3.5 millimeter jack. Right now, this is hooked up to an AVR, so the audio output format is grayed out. 
then we have the mute option and then the volume option for display we've got a few different aspect ratio options we've got 4 by 3 16 by 9 2.4 and then back to auto auto source search this will automatically search for active inputs you can rename sources here under source rename this will support 3d We've got 3D mode, we've got a few different options here. We've got auto, frame sequential, frame packing, top and bottom, side by side, or off. And then there's also a 3D sync invert. If your eyes are reversed, you can go ahead and change that there. Under HDMI settings, we've got a few different options here. We've got auto, full, limited, and then back to auto. Then we've got the HDMI equalizer, HDMI EDID, HDMI control on or off, and then HDMI link power on off. And then we do have 24p true cinema which you can turn on or off for installation we've got a few different options here we've got front front ceiling rear rear ceiling and then back to front here we've got some keystone options keep in mind that by adjusting the keystone option you are now effectively cutting into the usable pixel resolution so if you are adjusting this just keep in mind that you are chopping away at that 4K res and kind of digitally manipulating the image. So you kind of want to keep this on zero for both of these horizontal and vertical positions. So try to square up the projector as much as possible to your wall rather than using this. Under test pattern, this will put up a grid pattern to help you align the projector with your screen. High altitude mode will ramp up the projector's fan to keep this cooler if you're at high altitudes. It's got a 12 volt trigger, and then we've got some network settings. Under system, we've got different languages here. Background settings, we can change the splash screen from a black, blue, and then back to the BenQ logo. Under menu settings, you have two different options here. You've got the basic option and then the advanced settings, which we're looking at right now. Menu display time, you can have this always be on until you turn the menu off. You can have the menu timeout at 5 seconds, 10, 20, 30, and then always keep it on. Menu position, you can change that. Top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left, and then back to center. Then you have some ISF settings under color calibration. It's got the auto color calibration there. Light source information, this will tell you how many hours is on the projector itself. Operation settings, this will give you some reminders, LED indicator on the front of the projector. Power on off settings, which you can have direct power on or off, depending on how you are controlling this. Auto power off between 20 minutes, or you can disable it. Then we have the firmware upgrade and then the factory default, you can reset the entire projector. Then the last section is information. This will tell you exactly what is being pumped into the projector right now, the source resolution, source, picture mode, etc., etc. You can see all of that stuff right here. Now let's take a look at the other projector and go through some of the differences between the 860i and then what you're seeing here on the 4000i. Now there's a couple differences between the two projectors. First off being the option of brilliant color. The second option is under the advanced color settings, which is dynamic iris. Now for dynamic iris, this will brighten the image or darken the image depending on how bright or dark the content is on screen. So if it's a bright scene, the iris will open up to make the image overall brighter. But if it's a dim scene, such as this one, the iris will close down so that the black levels appear to be a bit darker. One of the biggest features between the 4000i and the TK860i is gonna be the wide color gamut support on the 4000. Right now we have it turned off and you can see that this image looks great. We've got a nice bright specular highlight there. We've got some nice shadow detail in the foreground with the rocky texture. And also the clouds have a bit of different color gradations with purples and blues, also some oranges as well. If we go ahead and turn on the wide color gamut, we can see that the overall brightness does take a little bit of a hit, but we can also see that the black levels are a little bit darker. The colors are a little bit richer as well. And by using the wide color gamut, this will help the projector reach its 100% coverage of DCI-P3. So you kind of have to take it upon yourself to decide whether you like the wide color gamut on or if you like it off for a slightly brighter picture, minus less richer colors. 
V860i does not have this feature. Now to test out how well the tone mapping is and how this projector handles bright scenes, we're gonna be playing the first demo here, which is the horses scene from the Spears and Munsell disc. This first screen here is at 600 nits. You can see that you can still kind of make out the footprints and the hoof prints in the snow. There's also the trees and also the mountains in the background, which are pretty discernible, so they're not too hard to see. And here at 1000 nits, it's not too dissimilar from the 600 nit version, so you can still see a lot of detail in the front and then also in the background. At 2000 nits, everything does become a bit more harder to see. The footprints in the snow are nearly gone. Also, the mountains in the tree in the background, almost totally gone as well. It's faintly there, but it is a lot harder to see than when we were coming from the 600 nit version. And here at 4000 nits, the background is almost completely washed out, totally white, and also the detail in the snow is just about totally gone as well. You can make out a little bit of the grass in the foreground, a little bit there in the middle of the screen as well, but for the most part, the only thing that's really visible are the horses and just those few strands of grass. And now to be fair, even some $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 projectors cannot handle a 4000 nit scene such as this. So this projector isn't really doing too bad. Moving over to the 860i with the same scene, we can see that at 600 nits, this looks pretty close to what it looked like on the 4000i. And as we can see at this 600 nit demo, we can see pretty much all the same detail as we did in the 4000i. We can see the hoof prints in the snow, we can see the mountains in the background, and also the trees in the background. Now moving over to the 1000 nit demo, this looks almost exactly the same as the 600 nit demo. Hoof prints are still present in the snow, the trees in the background, and also the mountainside in the background also still very clearly visible. Now 2000 nits, the horses are a bit more washed out looking. The hoof prints in the snow in the foreground also a little bit more washed out looking, but the background trees in the background mountains slightly washed out, but still very visible. And finally at 4000 nits, again, this looks just like the W4000i in that everything is now blown out. You can barely see anything in the background. The hoof prints in the foreground and in the middle almost totally washed out. The only thing that you can see are these blades of grass kind of sticking out of the grass, and also the horses themselves are also more washed out. So all in all, between the HDR performance and the tone mapping performance between the two projectors, they are very, very similar, although I would give the slight edge to the 4000i for being brighter. Now as far as shadow detail, we can see here that you can clearly make out that there's a soldier in the middle of the screen. There is some detail on that back wall to his left side, and there should also be some detail on the door that he's standing right in front of. All of these things are a little bit hard to see. If you want to go in and bring out some of that shadow detail and brighten up the image a little bit, you can jump into the advanced color settings and then bring up the HDR brightness slider. So right now, it's at zero, but you can see as we go up to plus one, and then also a plus two, all that detail is now retrieved on that back wall to the left side of the screen. You can now also see some more detail on the door that he's standing in front of. His jacket has also got a lot more detail. There's also some more subtle tones and gradations in his jacket as well. But keep in mind that if you are using the HDR brightness slider, the black levels will take a hit. So whereas at zero, the blacks are, they're not perfectly black, but they're also not gray. But the higher that you go up, those black levels will become a bit more raised and look more grayish than they will black. So keep that in mind. Now moving over to the 860i and checking out the same scene from 1917. For shadow detail, we can see automatically that the W4000i did look better. Better black levels, better shadow detail. The 860i is noticeably more washed out in comparison. There is a lack of detail on the left side wall right behind the soldier. And also there is a significant amount of black crush on the door that the soldier is standing in front of. So you cannot see any detail in that door. Now, if we go over to the HDR brightness slider, we can go ahead and move this up to a plus one and then a plus two, which maxes it out. Now we come a little bit closer to the 4000i, whereas we can now see some detail on that back wall behind the soldier. And also there is a little bit more detail now within the door on the right side of the soldier and there's more detail in this soldier's jacket with some better gradational tone as well. But again, the main difference here is that the black levels are definitely better on the 4000i. Also, contrast levels are better on the 4000i. 
Now one feature that the 4000i doesn't have is this feature called brilliant color. So now if we go ahead and bring this slider up, let's just max it out to a plus 10. We can now see all this detail is now retrieved on the left side of the soldier and there's a lot more detail being present on the door. Your black levels will suffer. As you can see in the letterbox bars, they do become a lot grayer if you do opt to use the brilliant color. But keep in mind, if you do have the brilliant color maxed out, you can see that not only are you amplifying the overall image brightness, but you are amplifying the posterization and gradation inside the image itself, as you can see by these spots here. So there is a little bit of give and take with using brilliant color. The W4000i does have the local contrast enhancer, which will divide the screen up to a thousand different areas or zones and pick specific spots depending on how dark or how bright the area is and either darken that area or brighten that area to enhance contrast and shadow detail to make the tone mapping work better. So right now we have it on zero, but if we go to low, medium, and then high, you can see how that changes the image. Keep in mind, once again, that if you are using these optional settings that this will raise the black levels and the black floor. And if you look at the black bars, letterbox bars, once again, the higher we go up, the lighter the black bars get. So you will raise black levels the higher that you set these settings at. Now for me personally, I do kind of like keeping it on either low or in the middle section, depending on the content that I'm watching. As far as sharpness and clarity, I found the 4000i to look a little cleaner and have a slightly more refined image. It might be a little tough to tell over the video, but I can see that his eyelashes are sharper and more defined, and his cheeks have more texture as well. You can also see how the stubble on his cheek looks a lot more pronounced on the 4000. Not that the 860 is bad, but there is a reason why the 4000 costs more. Both of these projectors have 3D support, so if you're a 3D fan and need an inexpensive way to watch your 3D collection, both of these do a fantastic job of giving you a great 3D immersive experience. They're both bright, sharp, and didn't have any noticeable crosstalk. You will need DLP 3D glasses, which do not come with the projectors. Luckily, you can pick them up on Amazon for fairly cheap. So it is almost a perfect 20-inch square. This is powered by a 2000 watt amplifier, service port, trigger, unbalanced RCAs, balanced XLRs, the main power switch, and then power inlet. And again, this is THX Ominous certified. Okay, so this is just one of them. I only unboxed the one, but we have two of these in for review. Let's go ahead and get this thing set up, and I'll come back and give you some thoughts and impressions. At the time of this video, the W4000i slash HT4550i is selling for $3,000 and the TK860i is selling for $1,800. If you're a stickler for video quality and have a max budget of $3,000, then the 4000i is going to give you a killer image and is definitely worth the extra spare change over the TK860i. If you're just getting into home theater and want something cost effective with 4K 3D support, then the 860i would be a great entry point in the home theater. Keep in mind that these are still entry-level DLP models in the world of projectors, which can go up to several times more than what these guys cost. And being reasonably priced DLPs, these still come up short for the deepest, darkest black levels, although the 4000i for its price is getting closer to some JVC and Sony's. Now unlike the JVC and Sony's, these do come with smart features with the included Android TV smart dongles. It's fairly snappy moving around the UI and it even supports Netflix 4K. They also have built-in speakers to make it an all-in-one portable big screen solution. So depending on your budget, BenQ's got you covered from entry level up to the higher end. They're great projectors for their price points and should make for an awesome big screen home theater experience. Now, if you do want to pick up any of these projectors, I'll leave some links for them down below in this video's description. So what are your thoughts on BenQ projectors? Have you seen one and what do you think of their performance? Leave a comment and let me know. As always guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like this video if you found it useful and subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you again in the next video.